Open our eyes, Jesus. Open our ears, Jesus. Help us hear from you. We must hear from you, Jesus. Lord, we ask for the weight of your glory. We ask for the weight of your spirit. We ask for your conviction. We ask for sobriety as we approach your word. Father, I pray that we would approach it with love and care, consideration. I pray that we open, oh, approach it with the appropriate conviction, my Lord. Be glorified, my Father. Amen. Amen. Um, quick review only for the sake of context of what we're going to hit. Jane, hey, Hi. Ken. So, um, quick review, we dialogue a little bit about uh, praise and the command of praise. Um, one of the differences that the scriptures gives us between uh, praise and worship, and you heard me mention that in prayer too, when we're talking about praise and worship that's so closely related, but the Lord does not seek praisers as the word, uh, or uh, as like there's no scriptures to say that God is looking for praisers. He's just saying, you do it. Praise is given as a command, but not worship. Worship is not given as a command. But yet we see in scriptures that the Lord is seeking people to worship him. Um, and we recognize that worship, like when it says uh, in Luke, in the dialogues about the Lord is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's why I'm saying the Lord is seeking them. He's looking for people to do that. Praise is not as personal, though it can be very personal. If you are a person who is in a very personal relationship with the Lord, then your praise can be quite personal, mm -hmm. but it does not always have to be personal. I praise, uh, I can be watching a football game or a, a good dancer or a martial artist and be praising them for their amazing ability, but I have no personal relationship with them. I'm, a, I'm recognizing their giftedness, their skill, their ability. People recognize and can recognize the giftedness, the skill, and the ability of the Lord, and even appropriately pay him homage for it, and yet still not have a personal relationship. The Lord is seeking somebody who is willing to lay their lives down, right, and to line themselves up and say, I am identified with God, right? And when you say that I am identified with him, this is who I am, this is what I do, I filter my life through this, like my entire life is a life of praise and worship. And so that's the individual that the Lord is seeking. I'm seeking those who will worship him or worship me in spirit and in truth. You got that? And so my question would be also to us one more time, and this is all we do to build up on where we're going. What does it again mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Anybody remember? What does it mean to worship God? To worship in God in spirit and in truth. I'm sorry, I did say Luke, it's actually John. It's John 4 where he talks about that. 
if you want to look at the passage, you can look it up. Uh, John 4, where the Lord is dealing with the Samaritan woman. That's where you get that passage. And he says uh, in verse 23, the hour is coming now. And when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such. God is looking for people who would do that um, to worship him, to do it willingly, to live their lives in that context. So what does that mean again? We dialogued about it. Uh, the book mm -hmm. actually dialogues about it as well. A couple times, mm -hmm. Bob dialogues about that. So what does that mean again? To worship willingly with your whole heart. Okay. <laughs> when you do we it. We have two words there. He said we worship him in spirit <laughs> and in truth. truth. So you want to be clear which one are you dialoguing about? Are we talking about worshiping him in spirit and that's what that means? Or are we talking about worshiping him in truth? Because if the Lord used two words there, we should consider the meaning of both words. Mm -hmm. That's mine. The first thing that came to mind was engaging your mind when you said it. So I guess okay. the truth part. Yes. Yes. Can somebody so, build on that? So the the truth of who he is, especially in no. relation to who we are. Okay. So when I worship him in spirit and truth, that I'm worshiping him knowing that he is like all knowing, all loving, and that I'm a flawed vessel. And yet he still loves me for that. That's good. That's right. Sincerity. Okay. Sincerity. So that so that we're not just doing it as a form or mm -hmm. as a tradition, but it it's true from the heart. Okay, so you would line that up with more so with truth as well as spirit. Knowing that God is spirit, so it's not like we're we're not we're not trying to have a rah rah session and bring to bring bring God out of hiding or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But we recognize that as we approach him in sincerity, his spirit will respond to um, to let us know that he is here and that sincerity brings <clears throat> all of that into play. Any other commentary? Everybody's right so far. Everybody's good. Anybody else want to add? I agree with everything you said. So, um, <laughs> because it's all right. <laughs> well, I was more thinking. Um, Ditto. Okay, I was thinking more thinking like uh, your spirit is like just dying out to your flesh and just like letting your spirit rise. But the spirit is willing, but the fle flesh is uh, weak. So I think like just meditating in the presence of the Lord, where it's like I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting about James, and I'm just really. Not, I'm putting Jesus center. I'm putting God the center, and just focusing all on God. Where, because uh, the truth is, <clears throat> He is God. So. Mm -hmm. Simple. Go ahead. Um, I, I feel like it's um, total um, surrender mm -hmm. and total authenticity. Mm -hmm. Authenticity. Yeah. Say what? Authenticity. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. I like it. Now. We were doing good <laughs> with kind of explain. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marshall. You can add in next. Well, to add to that, I was also thinking it's not just a one time thing like when you lifestyle. worship, but it's our lifestyle. So worshiping in spirit and truth is that walking the truth of who I am daily in Him, and that is also my worship. The just man, like man. you were saying during prayer, like when we have our like anger and we have our times where we're kind of in us, are we still representing Him? And are we still thinking what he wants to do and what he wants to say? So walking in his spirit and in the truth of who he is every day throughout our entire lives, everywhere we are. Yeah. So I'm liking everything that we're saying. One of the things I want us to actually look at is uh, some of the more concrete practicals. And one of the pictures that I painted for us, and you guys were all kind of flirted with this when we said, hey, we're worshiping in spirit. Um, one of the ways that spirit is also interpreted is that the emotional aspect of worship, the, the part that's hard to gauge but we all ascribe to, it's almost like what's the definition of love? And we can give descriptors of love, but if we were to try to define it, we all kind of come up short. We can't define it well, but yet we know it's something that everybody longs for and it is expressed in a multitude of different ways. And yet 
though we can't all describe it, again, like I said, we all ascribe to it, we say we need it, and we need to express it. And so the spirit is the part that's just a little hard to grasp, but it's an emotional response. The truth, I'm going to write a little bit more so on what Maisha also called out, was it's, it's practical. It's like, how do I show it? Like, again, using love for an example, I show my love for my wife by washing dishes, cooking a meal, paying the bills, <laughs> keeping gas in the car, knocking the snow off the car. But yet, I'm doing all these things to express love to her, but nobody would use any of those things to say that's what love is. But yet, it's what I do because of it. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. And so when we're looking at I'm living my life as a life of worship, and again, where I'm going with this is what do we do practically to continue to push uh, uh, an atmosphere of worship in our house, <laughs> Church of Love Faith Center, as well as in our homes, wherever we reside. And so we have to think, what are the things concretely that I'm doing to show that I worship God in this way? What am I doing to make sure that I keep my heart fully engaged when I'm interacting with God? And that was one of the things that Pastor Myra kicked out because it's a clear threat. It really is a threat that we just go in and just, this is what I do. We come up here and we're singing a song. Nobody else is in the room, but that's okay. I'm going to sing my song. And that's the real threat, right? I came in, I walked in earlier today for a brief moment when we're bringing my kids downstairs for prayer. And it was exactly the circumstance I described. They were the only ones in the room. There was clearly more people on the stage than in the room because that was just about it. James and the team was up there ready to do their job and it's easy for us to disconnect Mm -hmm. like why did i get again why did i rush here from work why is this mind you and we all know that it's a beautiful and noble task but yet our enemy is very good at doing things to disconnect Mm -hmm. what do we do to ward off that threat what do we do practically what do we do emotionally that's why i deliberately separate the terms and trying to keep us all in a place of separating so we can say, I'm giving this concrete, this is what I'm going to do, and this is also what I'm aware of to keep my heart engaged, mm-hmm. because they're both necessary. James? Well, for me, uh, the Holy Spirit has just been having me in the book of Psalms, and I've just been reading Psalms every morning, um, plus reading my daily devotion, uh, but most importantly, just seeking God and just been praying. Um, and since then, it's kind of like God has opened himself up more and more, because I'm seeking and I'm in his face. I've been in his face more every morning, like early in the morning. Sometimes God will wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it'll be 4. Mm-hmm. And then I just get that word in and just really meditate in the presence of the Lord before I actually start my day. Mm-hmm. And remind myself that through my job, or just like what Pastor Meyer was saying to the congregation, you know, it's easy to see what it looks like in the physical realm, but we can't go by what it looks like in the physical mm-hmm. realm. We're still walking in the spirit. And like you said today, what this house has been declared over the, the prophetic word that's been over this house and stuff, mm-hmm. um, and how he had us all come together and put, uh, pray. And to me, it was just like bringing, it's gluing everything together because I'm staying constantly in his face, in, in his word, and trying to get a under, better understanding mm-hmm. of who God is. Amen. What sustains, this is for anybody specifically in the worship team, what sustains you the best? Like, obviously, there's many different answers that can come forth. And let's see if we can land on our feet. What is the best sustaining fact or information or scripture, something that anchors us when our enemy continues to thwart his barrage of lies at us? Um, mine is, my, the scripture that I stand on the most is, um, Trust me, Lord, all that heart may not expound understand that all that was expounded from his heart directly. So every okay. part of my life, it has been my mm-hmm. mantra. Mm-hmm. Like, um, even from age 15, 16 years mm-hmm. old, when I really became saved, um, that has been something that has yeah. just been my path and how he guides my footsteps each and every day. Wow. Not knowing well. So that, that in my life and him guiding me keeps me connected to the worship that 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 the sincere authentic worship yeah. that mm-hmm. I have towards the Lord and because I know he loves me so much unconditionally and even when I'm tossed and, and don't know which way to go he he just cradles me so mm-hmm. my love for God right. is just so sincere and 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 I know that he cares for me mm-hmm. and I know that if I have a concern anything that goes on in my life 
I just worship him. And so worship has become part of my fabric, part of my being and who I am. Mm -hmm. And no matter what trials I may face, worship, even just sitting in silence and just reading the word takes me through. So that's my, that's me. Mm -hmm. And I also want to add that other verse, be not wise in your own eyes. Because I'm like, I heard, you know, read that scripture a lot. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge that he shall direct the path. But as I continue to read, mm -hmm. the next verse was like, be not wise in your own eyes. So mm -hmm. therefore, like, do not go by what it looks like, go by what it feels like. What helps me is like when we sing the songs of, you know, uh, do you, I can do anything. And um, I can do all things because it's you that gives me strength. And I'm simply saying, like, if we're saying that I'm not going to go by what it looks like, I'm not going to go by what it feels like, when the microphone's off and the musicians are not playing and stuff, and I'm not just having a regular conversation, why am I still doing the opposite of what I was thinking about and stuff? So that's really got my attention. So I try to look at it where it's like, okay, really go in depth of what the song really means of, do you, I can do anything. Do you, I can do all things, because it's you that gives me strength. Amen. And I was watching a sermon of, of Joyce Myers, and she was saying, like, how um, that's not saying that everybody has a gift, and you got to know what gift mm -hmm. that you operate in. Mm -hmm. That scripture saying that we can do all things through Christ is not saying that literally we can do all things through Christ. I but, can sing even if I can't carry a tune. Right. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It <laughs> doesn't mean that. It, it means, like, whatever God has placed you at, you know what I'm saying, you can do all things that, that God has equipped you with. I can't remember because it was a while since I saw that sermon. It's 4.13. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're but it was yeah. really, but it was really good. And I'm like, she gave me a different. I'm like, oh, okay. Because so many people think like I can do literally everything, mm -hmm. and I'm like, no. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> you throw that at my children, all of a sudden my kids are thinking they're unicorns, and my son's a superhero. That's, what, that's, <laughs> like, no, that's not, right. No, that's not what you can do. So, right. But that's, well, they want to be creative. But hey, it's right. like, and we as adults can also be inappropriately creative with that right. and yeah. try to do something like, what are we doing? And so I did, and in the the literal context in that verse. Paul was saying before, he says, I know how to have plenty and I know how to be a base and I know how right. to be in lack. Uh -huh. He right. says, I can, regardless to whatever I'm going through in right. life, I can do all things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that, that's what that verse is actually talking about. And yeah. that's all good. Does anybody, because you guys are giving me certain scriptures, does, has anybody actually considered and made it a focus to consider the heart of the Lord in your responses to these things? Mm -hmm. Or even heaven in and of itself. We read in, again, this is Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, set your affections on things above mm -hmm. where no moth or rust or thieves can, or can corrupt it, no thieves break in or steal heaven. Like, when we come into worship, the thing that I, that anchors me better than anything else honestly is those heavenly rewards mm -hmm. those promises that that there will be no more sickness and disease there will be no more injustices there will be no more suffering there there will be pleasures as the scripture says that god himself has pleasures forevermore in his right hand and these things i'm like lord and it it anchors in a certain way. That's why the Lord says, set your affections on these things, even in your worship. Because the scriptures you guys gave are, are amazing and are really good. But I'm also trying to set an object mm -hmm. of our affection. Because you guys didn't give me an object, you gave me principles. And the principles are excellent, mm -hmm. amazing principles, and they anchor us all often. We need those principles because often we lie to ourselves right. and we want to, because both of you guys gave scriptures about understanding, right? And we want to believe because of our foolish pride that we understand the circumstance and we have the right to respond in a way that's actually not glorifying to mm -hmm. the Lord. But there is an object. There is a person, the man Christ Jesus. There is the God man that stands right there with nail pierced wrists and feet and says I am the reason and when you fix on that and like I see the person and I'm connected with the lover of my soul and the promises around him 
Now it does not matter what hell I endure. Mm. I'm anchored. Now, in light of our homes, has anybody started doing anything in their homes as of yet? Anybody tried anything? Oh, yeah, I'm moving slower than molasses going up on Christmas Eve. Come on now. Oh, I don't want to slow coming down on Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, but it's a given for myself to mm-hmm. worship in my home. It's okay. Me to read mm-hmm. my word, to pray, yeah. to fellowship, to fuss, to. Um, Ain't nobody ever yet. Are you fussing? Are you fussing? Oh, I, I, when I fuss, I go back and forth with the Lord <laughs> his word and the things I don't understand or the things I think I understand that I just didn't get. So I really, it's usually a wrestling that happens. But I do a lot when it comes down to, um, it's just a given. So when yeah. you ask that question, it's, it's a norm right. for myself. Yes. Okay, so we have a norm for ourselves. How, and some of you guys also have similar lives because I've talked to you about it and you've shared with me some of the stuff you've done personally. And that's a blessing. How do you take it further? How do we take that further? Because remember, the goal of the Christian life is like, Lord, I must go further. I must go deeper. I must take this expression further. And because God is endless, we always can. So therefore, the question now arises, how do we take it further? Some of us just need to start. <laughs> you know, but others of us need to take it further well, because we're in different places in our walk. True, right. So how? So we want to encourage it all. We are all. That's one of the things that I prayed about even during prayer. Right? I said, "Hey, some of us have been doing this for a long time, and so therefore our prayers will look one way, and that's fine. Let us celebrate where everybody is and push further." So I would throw this to Cleaster. I would throw it to like. The Cassandra Davis is in the room with the Pastor Myers or others who I've talked to who actually say, yes, I do live a life of worship. So the question is, how do we take it further? And some of us need to say, okay, well, let's, what is it going to look like when we start? How do I just get my life around this? Because this is the life of worshiper, of a worshiper. This is what we're claiming. And we're saying, if I am a worshiper, that means everything that I do is being looked at through this specific lens that the Lord has provided. And it's what I want to do. Not that he's asking or made me to do it. It's just that I want to do this because I've encountered something that is so blessed, I can't help myself but to respond. Yes. Well, for me. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I was ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, James. <laughs> I, have, I have been yes, intrigued to start from Genesis. So I've just been so fascinated by the. I mean, we always, you know, just going through and really just. Yeah, it was even so fascinating. I even went on Google Maps looking <laughs> at the rivers and all the stuff. Yeah. I was just so intrigued. Like, it uh-huh. was just amazing. So for me, that has been something that I have enjoyed because before I'm like, oh God, this is so <laughs> But God is really helping me to understand who was who and 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 who was married to this person yeah. and who did this and who who pretended to be um you know um the, the, the he was a wife and and then said he was a sister and it's just it's just interesting to me and I'm I'm enjoying yeah yeah mm-hmm. now I'm enjoying. Knowing and I really wanted to commit because God really just told me because sometimes memory for me like remembering things and it's amazing that he I was cooking something and I started singing a yes, scripture right. that I, I had learned a while ago but just I said you know I repay it so much better when I sing it mm-hmm. and yeah, it, yeah. It, it 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 stays you know because sometimes just even though I know how to recite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's better for me to sing because yeah, yeah. it just kind of. Cassandra, can I tell you the nice truth? What? It's better for us all oh. to sing it. It's we really don't. awesome. Even, I don't care if you are a good singer or not. It forces an emotional engagement. And what you're seeing Cassandra spill over with is her joy of the emotional engagement. Mm-hmm. That's why I sing some of my prayers. I, I, mm-hmm. I've been trying to actually sing my prayers more than I speak them for that one purpose. Of it, folk. It's like when you try to sing something, it forces a level of emotional engagement and focus. Even when we pray, there are times when we can be praying and check out. How many of us have been that person that just also we're just kind of talking, but we're saying stuff, but we're really not saying stuff, and somebody's yelling at us for mumbling, right? Because we're not. There's certain things that 
when we're trying to be clear with the point, we inflect a certain way. Mm -hmm. We make sure that we shoot for the eye contact. These are things that are actually becoming very much lost in our generation these days. Mm -hmm. And the older generation knows it and talks much junk about it. Mm -hmm. That's like, you're always talking to me with a phone in your hand. Mm -hmm. Put your phone down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right? And so when we say, okay, I'm gonna put all this stuff aside, and I put it down, and I'm talking to my wife, as opposed to talking at my wife, mm -hmm. or we're talking to one another, as opposed to at one another, mm -hmm. There is a difference. And there are times when we can even be talking at the Lord uh -huh. and not to him. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we want to be careful mm -hmm. because all it takes is when you choose not to emotionally engage. Now, when you're singing, there's no way in the world. Mm -hmm. It's really hard not to be engaged when you're singing your prayer mm -hmm. or when you're singing to somebody. Yeah. It's just like, it yeah. well, just can't be done. That's what happened to the praise team on Saturday. So it was kind of like, Lone just started playing chords and stuff. And... All of a sudden, I just hear the Holy Spirit say, you are with me. And then we just say, you are with me. And then all of a sudden, I came from scriptures. And then the scriptures were the verses. And then we just, for you Amen. are with me. Yeah. And Pastor Brian sent out a text saying, we need to record this song and stuff. And I said, you are with me. I said, it's funny because that's the title of the song. Yeah. You are with me. Yeah. And that's because it's like everything that I said that I do, writing my prayers, um, reading devotions, staying in songs. But also when I'm in my car, I don't I turn the radio off. And I just it's just me and God. It's just like Lord, I really want to hear from you. You know what I'm saying? What's on your heart today? What's well, how should I start my day? How do you want me to start my day? Give me wisdom when to speak, when to keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Now, with what James just said, um, we have to recognize that some of us may end up being the inverse of that. Some of us who drive in our cars and we keep everything off may need to turn something on instead of working today. Mm -hmm. May need to start our Bible. The goal that I'm shooting for right now is what are we going to intentionally do to make us or make the things, our, our homes, our dwelling places of this church, a place of worship. And so one more time I'm going to ask, does anybody have even ideas? What else can we do? Like I've shared my personal ones, right? I talked about journaling. We've had a few others talk about journaling. I talked about my prayers. My kids have a prayer book. So this week, because we break fast, what do we do when I break fast? I talked about it like three or four times already. What do we do? Take you remember? What? Take communion. Thank you. I'm glad somebody finished it. I take communion. We literally go out and buy Wegmans, a loaf of bread from Wegmans, one of them Italian loaves that I chop up, and then my wife and I will come out with some butter, sometimes a little bit of honey. Yeah, well, it's because after we break it, and then everybody just kind of does their own thing and just enjoy the bread. So, and that's cool. My kids, that's what we do. And we have our Welch's grape juice right there, and we hit it around the table. We Our tradition is we read the passage right there in Corinthians. We just read it. It's only like, you know, a dozen verses. We also flip over to Galatians chapter 5. We focus on the uh, fruit of the spirit for the family. This week, it's patience. So we all pray for patience over one another and in the house. We have a prayer list. Everybody writes down what they're praying for. And this past week, I have to say, right now, the Lord is really doing something for my children and for my heart as well, because I've never had so many prayers answered so fast. I have prayer journals. My prayer journals, over 90% of them have been answered, but sometimes I finish the entire journal put the journal away, forget about it, pick it up five years later and realize it was all answered. Wow. Now, the fact of the matter is, this time I am in the page. We have to flip to another page and before two weeks are out, the Lord has answered everything and my kids see it. One of the big things that we were praying for has been uh, a friend of mine was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Love this girl. She's on a board with me for a number of ministries that I work with as well in the city. And so just been in the trenches with this girl for a while. She's married, has a husband, two children. Both children are, are collegiate in age, so they're in their 20s. So she's an older woman. She's a little older, not that old. you know. And the fact of the matter is when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, we were earnestly praying for her, earnestly, because I, I, her daughter would come over to my house for Bible studies, and she was shook, and we'd bring her to the Bible studies. You were there. You actually know the daughter because you were at one of the Bible studies. I'm talking to Maisha. And so, and James. And the woman got prayed for, we can't find breast cancer in her body. Amen. Can't find it. The doctors were astounded. Can't find it. Amen. And there's been about a half a dozen prayers that were a focus of my, my children and I, and every single one of them have been answered. 
and it's been it's it's been stoking my kids' hearts. They're like, okay, let's see what else are we gonna bring to the Lord, and they've been trying to look for something extravagant. So I'm saying, wow. when you start doing this, you're developing a memory. You're developing a history that is hard for the enemy to thwart. Because remember, he tries to make us forget. Mm -hmm. If he can get you to forget about that experience you had with the Lord back in the day mm -hmm. and get you to step away from the church, mm -hmm. he's got you right where he wants uh -huh. you, alone and confused. Uh -huh. We don't want that, right? Mm -hmm. So what can we do? We talked about me doing communion. What do you do that you can measure, that you can say, you know what? Like, we were talking about what can we do that's different for those who are very mature. I would say to a Cleaster or a Pastor Meyer or to a Cassandra or some of the others who have been doing this for a while, I say, bring somebody else in the equation. You say, I always do it. Well, do it with somebody. Mm -hmm. Bring someone else in the equation where iron can sharpen iron and that you can also build a memory with another person Growing in the depth of the Lord, Amen. growing in the fear and the love of the Lord, because it doesn't have to be just you by yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. You can grab somebody who is younger and pull them up. You can grab somebody who is older in the Lord and allow them to pull you up. Mm -hmm. But either way, there's various things that we can do. We can talk to like when a uh, quick marriage note as well, because James and Maisha are on on the uh, on yeah. they're about to get married in in a few weeks now, yeah, yeah. just a couple weeks. And so one of the things that I did was I said, Lord, I need you to highlight a couple of couples because I want to model my relationship off of somebody that I love and trust. Mm -hmm. I don't want to argue and fight with my wife. I don't want to yeah. be in the position of being abusive towards my wife. I don't want to be in a position to manipulate or harm my wife. And these are things that were very much in my family's past. And so though I have not done any of those things as of yet, I'm like, Lord, I'm not going to state that they do not exist in me. I am a broken man who is in need of help. Lord, where can I go to learn? And I asked Lord, he highlighted a couple of couples. So I said, hey, can we spend time together? I want help. How do you keep such peace in your household? How do you keep so much love in your household? How are you guys consistently so kind? What do you do? Is it a front? Or do you do that whenever I come over? Or when other people come over? Or is it actually genuine? And when you hear the wife or the husband and share in tears and say, no, this is real. Mm -hmm. wow. And it's because of the Lord. Then I learn. Mm -hmm. So we do life in community, which is the reason why I talked about communion in the first place, because communion was never meant to be done only in the church anyway. The context, even if you look at the scriptures, it doesn't make sense if we're doing it in light of a church building. It makes more sense in light of somebody's home. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're done. <laughs> Questions, <laughs> comments, concerns? I didn't touch everything that I had to hit off today, um, but I did want us to consider those scriptures again about worshiping in spirit and in truth, mm -hmm. looking for the concrete, looking for the emotion. What can we do? So I'm asking you, please take something into consideration, peg somebody to do life with, to encourage them and to have them encourage you. Find a practice or discipline to implement in your life and make it a goal. If you say, you know what, every Friday night, worship night at my house, we're going to sit down and we're going to worship. We're going to play a bunch of videos off of, off of YouTube or we're going to play some old con Kirk Franklin concerts just to reminisce and laugh. And then, Lord, I'm going to ask that while we're even sitting here laughing and talking that the spirit really show up. And we have good fellowship singing to some of our old songs that used to minister to us a decade back. And just see what happens. And say, I'm going to commit to doing this every other week on a Friday night or something like that. Once a month on a Friday night. And then you've committed to something. Now, will you drop the ball with whatever you commit? Guaranteed. I promise you. So don't be afraid of what if I miss a day. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is when you, this is the power of a focused life. When you focus on doing something, you're going to hit at least 80% of it. 70% of it. I don't care what the percentage is, it's going to be better than none of it. And if you make no plans, it's going to be none of it. That's just what you're going to get. Nothing. Because you plan for nothing. And do you, do you see my goal? Just do something. It will be busted for a while. I promise you. When I said I do my bedtime routine with my kids, we do two chapters of the Bible a night, sing worship songs, and we pray in birth order. It's, it's been a mess for years before it's matured yeah, yeah. but now it's maturing 
And my kids understand the beauty and the importance of prayer, even my three-year-old son. I can't, I, I, that is just too precious to me. Mm -hmm. It was worth every frustration that happened mm -hmm. while my kids were running around and somebody threw off their diaper and all this other craziness is going on. And I'm like, hold up, we're trying to read the Bible. None of them can read anyway. <laughs> and it's just, you get the point. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be messy. Jesus, we thank you. And we ask that you be glorified in our lives. We really wanna be a people that worships you in spirit and in truth. Help us to understand what that means. Help us to get a better glimpse of that heavenly reality that you have invited us into. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody.